Everybody, happy Friday morning all across North America. The final session, the final teaching session. This is it, winding it down. Three more weeks to go. So I want to take just a second before we launch into the final competency, a commitment to continuous improvement. I want to take just a second to talk about the tools that you've been utilizing and how you can utilize them in the future. So the web portal for you, your mid-level and frontline will be available all the way through the end of the year. So till January 1st, you can access the information. What, what does that mean? That means it's there. That if you want other people to go through the program, if you want to switch tracks in the program, if you have a frontline staff person that aspires to leadership and you want to put them through the, the mid-level, um, the Leading Others Today uh, track, you can do that. If you want to take, the, take some of the information from that track, or if the mid-level want to take the executive leaders track, or whatever, you can do that. It's there, it's available. All of the handouts, all of the MP3 files, all of the videos, everything available to you. Many departments who have gone through the program in the past have revisited it maybe in their quarterly meetings or in their weekly meetings or in their monthly meetings or in their annual meetings. Come back to the information. Because what has occurred is you have now everyone having heard a similar philosophy. You have some consistency in language and, and, and concept. And you can play off of that. And, that. and that was what it was meant to do. So it's available to you. Now, how ironic that our subject matter today is continuous improvement when I've just told you that you have a tool that you've already paid for that you can utilize into the future to continuously improve. And a little secret, let me tell you a little secret. You know what I'd do if I were you? I'd go in and I would download all those videos. Download the FLV file and hold on to it so that you don't just have them till the end of the year but you have them forever. Well how come we can't just have them forever? Well, just because of the, <coughs> the status of APWA and, and, and uh, nonprofit and so on and so forth, and I don't know why. But for whatever reason, we can't let you have it for, into perpetuity. But what I would do if I were you is I would download all the material, I would download the MP3 files, I would download the video files and burn them to a disk, and you've got your own training, and you're done, and you got it and you can continue to revisit it and revisit it and revisit it and revisit it. Okay? Please utilize it. So now let's segue into the final competency. Let's look back for a second. We said that we were in changing times. You agreed and I agreed that we're in changing times. You agreed and I agreed that the ways that we've done things in the past may not be effective if times have changed. So we agree we're in changing times and we agree that the, the potential at least the potential is there that the way that we've done things in the past probably won't apply today. Now, you and I both know it's more than potential. It's the reality. The reality is you can't do things like you've done them before for a lot of different reasons, but primarily because things have changed. So if things have changed, then what are the leadership approaches that we need today? And that's what we've been walking through. We call them competencies. And we talked about being an agent of change, knowing how to change things, knowing how to change yourself, knowing how to change your department, knowing how to expand your sphere of influence as a community builder. That this concept of a community builder was about you understanding budgets, you understanding roads and bridges, you understanding water, you understanding engineering, facilities, fleet yards, those kind of things. But the next step was to be a community builder. And your role as an executive leader, unlike all of the other tracks, your, one of your roles was to be an advocate for the profession and for the professionals. Not just so that they can get you know, good benefits and wages, but so that people in your area and in your region understand the vital nature that infrastructure plays and that we can't have a free society without you. 
And are you fulfilling your role as a community builder, both literally and figuratively, are you community building? Are you building consensus across all stakeholder groups? Are you the collaborator, the convener? Are you the agent of change? Then we talked about to do that, you better have great systems. That as an executive leader, you're all about the systems. And whether that's a system for motivation or whether that's a system for gathering thoughts, ideas, and concerns, or whether that's a system for, for, for time management, whatever the system is, that the only way to take on the challenges of today that are multifaceted, too complex, and in which we do not have enough resources, time, or energy available, that the only way were quality systems and that the 21st century would be ruled by the systems thinker. Then we talked about being a catalyst for responsibility. That somehow I got to get other people to take on a little bit more when I'm challenged with doing more with less. All right. Now it brings us to the last week or the last three weeks. How do we sustain this? How do we continuously improve? Now you've gone to that workshop, I've gone to that workshop. Some of you have maybe have instituted a continuous improvement strategy within your organization. But most times, as you look across society and you look within organizations, most times you don't see people, organizations, institutions, communities, or nations continually improving. Renewing themselves regularly. Renewal. 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 Exhibiting the aspects and the attributes that the times require. And then as times change around us, renewing ourselves or renewing our department or renewing our institutions or our community to meet the demands of the day. Usually, it's reactive. It's a reactive mindset. Your wife tells you, you better get in a little bit better shape. Maybe the, she makes a couple comments here and there, or your husband does the same. And the next thing you know, you start thinking to yourself, eh, I probably should get in shape. Or you have a couple of run-ins with some people and you think, oh man, I probably should check my attitude. I'm always amazed that it takes a second DUI for the guy to realize he's got an issue. Or the second divorce for the gal to realize she has some attachment problems. Or the second kid going through rehab for people to realize maybe we weren't the greatest parents. So usually, continuous improvement is forced through dire's need. Haydn, the great composer, said, we are what we are out of dire's need. That when the pressure's on, we're then forced to improve or die, figuratively, or even literally speaking. Well, somewhere along the way, that flipped. And somebody said, well, wait a minute. Why am I waiting for the pressure for us to improve? Why am I just not proactively improving, renewing myself continually. Now what's funny is we thought that was an epiphany in Western society, but there was other societies that already got that. Well, who was the guy that, that helped plant those seeds into the United States and North America? It was a guy named Deming, <clears throat> the father of continuous improvement, if you will, <clears throat> or at least the guy who brought it over. Well, over, over from where? Well, here's the funny thing. This guy named Deming, he was a, a futurist, a lecturer, a business leader, a statistician, a philosopher, an educator, a business guru, Deming. And after the, 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 the end of World War II, the United States government called this guy Deming, and they're like, hey, our, 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 our W.E., E. W. Edwards Deming. I always wanted the first initial and then my name. That was pretty cool. Like, hey, you're a superstar. You know what you're doing. We want you to go to Japan. And what do you want me to do in Japan? We want you to help rebuild the manufacturing sector in Japan. Okay, why do you want me to do that? Because we've got to rebuild this nation. Because if they're, if they're, if they're not rebuilt, problems could happen down the road. So let's get this thing rebuilt so that they can be a, a viable member of the global community. So Deming heads over. 
And he's looking at the manufacturing sector. He's looking at the assets that can be built upon, not just the physical assets, but more importantly, the intangible assets, the cultural assets. What assets does this country have at its disposal, these people have at their disposal? And you know what he came across? He came across this thing called Kaizen, Kaizen, whatever. Now, my wife speaks Japanese, so she always corrects me and tells me I say it wrong. So that's fine. Whatever. Kaizen, Kaizen, whatever. I'm not being disparaging. I'm just saying, okay, I don't pronounce it right. But the concept was this. It was a cultural concept. That there was honor and nobility in continually getting better. Of renewing of improving, that we don't wait for somebody else to tell us we need to improve, that we, we improve just as a natural part of who we are as an individual and as a people. Well, Deming was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Imagine if you took that concept and applied it to the business world. So instead of waiting for customers to complain about quality, you were always improving quality. And instead of having suppliers complain about delivery times, you are always trying to improve delivery times. Yeah, but no one's complaining about delivery times. That's true. But for us to compete, let's try to get better at delivery times anyways. And everybody was like, wow. Think about how that could transform. Think about our competitive advantages. So the funny thing about this Deming guy was that he was a, he was, I'm using my computer today. The funny thing about him was most people regard him as having more impact on Japanese manufacturing and business than any other individual who was not of Japanese heritage. This guy Deming. Then what did he do? He came over to the United States. And although he was a hero to some degree in Japan, it wasn't until after his death that he really took hold. Now, he did bring some of his ideas and principles to the manufacturing industries of the United States, car industry and others. But after his departure from this world, as happens oftentimes, everybody realized the guy was brilliant. The father of continuous improvement. So, this idea, this concept, that I don't need someone else to tell me and I don't need someone else to tell us that we should get better and that I'm committed to getting better. If the sun comes up, I'm going to work on getting better. If the clouds, I'm going to work on getting better. That it's just a part of who I am. Now, what's the competitive advantage of that if you're in business? And more importantly, what's the advantage of that if I'm serving the public? If I'm serving the public, if the public can count on me to every morning when I wake up be working to serve them better and that our infrastructure will continually be better. Well, that's not the case today. I didn't say that was the case today. I just said, what if? Imagine if. Imagine if we had that. Do you think that people would trust their institutions of government to a greater degree than they do today? I think that they would. If we established ourselves as the gold standard of stewardship, the gold standard of, of, of service, the gold standard of management, the gold standard of leadership, if we established ourselves, the public works sector, as the gold standard of how to do things, and I will tell you, in many departments that I've been to across North America, haven't come to Australia yet, Gary, and Lismore, Australia, but come on down. I'd be happy to come on down. I'm kidding. As I travel, there are pockets of excellence, no doubt. There are pockets of absolute excellence. But do we see that consistently across the board? I don't know. You have to answer that question. So if, if continuous improvement is so brilliant, if it's so enlightened, if it's so awesome, then why didn't it happen? <laughs> why didn't it happen? Well, I think it's important before we can 
to have a discussion about instilling a commitment to continuous improvement in our toolkit, in our organization. An executive leader has to understand why it doesn't happen so that they can create strategies to overcome those challenges and those barriers. The number one reason continuous improvement doesn't work is because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Because it takes work to continuously improve. Because you're tired at the end of the day, so you don't read the book. You're tired in the early morning, so you don't go to the gym. You're fatigued by life, and so you don't continuously improve. And that's the same reason why we don't have systems and processes in place to continuously improve within our departments. That's why we don't have systems in place to gather thoughts and ideas and concerns, prioritize those thoughts, ideas, and concerns, and then deploy the best of those thoughts, ideas, and concerns. That's why we don't have systems in place for the soft skills development. But at the end of the day, it's all about leadership. The number one determining factor of a successful organization is leadership, and not just at the executive level, but at all levels. The number one factor to building a great, thriving community is leadership in all sectors, in all silos, at all levels, period. Don't believe me? Read Gordon's work on leadership. That's his book, On Leadership, before he died back in the 90s. Phenomenally. And what did he talk about? He said this. He said, you know what? At the end of the day, it's going to be about leadership. And you know what I want to say back to him? He's now passed on. That's not a revelation. What's your point? My point is we don't have time to develop leaders. That's why we don't improve. Because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Why else do we don't improve? Well, I think one of the reasons we don't improve is because we don't intentionally create processes and systems to do so. Because if it's not set in stone, then it probably won't happen. Remember, systems either organically grow up or intentionally develop. And what's a system? A sequence of actions. What's a plan? A sequence of actions. So a system is, is various parts aligned to achieve a common goal or achieve a stated goal. What's a plan? Action steps aligned in the most logical way to get you to that outcome. Isn't it funny how they both coincide or they both intertwine? So one of the reasons that, that we don't develop bench strength or we don't have a culture of continuously improving is because we don't have systems in place. We talked about a law of motion in the past, the law of inertia, but there's a lot of not, another law of motion that talks about things deteriorating back to their natural state. So within a department, you have to work aggressively to put systems in place that will fight against things moving to their natural state of chaos. So the second reason we don't continuously improve is because we haven't built the systems to do it. Now let me be very, very clear on that, that we can talk about continuous improvement all we want, but practically speaking, it takes time and systems to actually accomplish it. Now, I would suggest to you that the, that the investment of time and resources, not money necessarily, but time and energy, the return you'll get for that will far outweigh your initial investment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And, and then finally, I think one of the reasons that we don't continuously improve is that <laughs> it's not a part of our culture. It's not a part of our culture. It's not a part of our culture. In our culture, somehow we've got this idea that I'm going to come to a place where I make it. I make it. I've made it. Implying that I've reached the pinnacle. I don't have to work anymore. I don't have to try anymore. I don't have to bust my butt anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. That I have made it. There's, there's an expression that says, once I believe that I've made it, I've begun my descent. The moment I believe that I've made it, I've begun my descent. And isn't it funny, when you do an exploration of history, there's no place on the planet where people have said, I've made it, and then continued to have success. What do you mean by that? Look, 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 look at ancient cultures. 
in the ancient Greek culture, the concept was arte, this idea of, of continually growing and continually learning. Or in the Hebrew culture, the, the concept of sojourning. Or like I just told you about, in the Japanese culture, this concept of kaizen, this concept of continually improving. And in all of those situations, the idea of enlightenment came from me getting better tomorrow than I was yesterday. That there was nobility and honor in that. Today, there's nobility and honor in the United States, Canada, and even Australia, where people say this, I've made it. I don't need to improve anymore. Isn't that funny, Jeff? I don't need to improve anymore. So we, uh, uh, we uh, place value on the guy who can stand up and say, I don't need to get any better. Well, that's a, that's a joke. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And we do the same thing in our communities, and we do the same thing in our workplace. Now, is it because we're lazy? I don't know. I don't know what we are. I just know it doesn't serve us well. It won't possibly serve us well. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm just here to say that that, that decision, that mindset, can't possibly serve us well. So, with all of that said, and I think that that's an intense and important aspect of this. I think we have to look at a final thing, or two final things that Deming pointed out. He said that there were some deadly sins to leadership that would kill us as executive leaders. First, he said a lack of consistency of purpose. That if we didn't have consistent purpose, if, they, if, if there was inconsistency in purpose, we were challenged. Now, here's the funny thing. I preach, you got to change, you got to change, you got to change, you got to change. And, and I do preach it, and I will continue to evangelize that message. But there is a, there's, a, there's a fine intertwining of consistency and change. There are some things I need to be consistent in. Consistent in. Consistent in. And there are some things I need to be continually renewing in. Continually renewing in. Consistent, the why. Renewing, the how. I, I have to be consistent in my why. Because if I'm consistent in my why, people know what they can expect. I may adjust my how. I may change my how every year to be more relevant, to be more impactful. But I'm, we're not going to change the why. That makes sense? So, yes, we have to be continually renewing so that we're relevant and impactful, but we're consistent in our why. Okay? Emphasis on short-term gains. Emphasis on short-term gains. Just lay that across Western society today. Emphasis on short-term gains. Mobility of management. So if we start changing leaders regularly, that, that's a deadly sin because people don't know who their leader is. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what direction we're headed. Now, it says running a company. Obviously, he was speaking in terms of company, business. We're speaking in terms of the public sector. But visible figures alone, when we start working only off of budget, that's the tough part about your work. What's the value of clean water? <laughs> what's, the, what's the value of a safe bridge? What's the value of a pipe we will never see? But it, 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 it transfers and transforms. It transfers and then transforms sewage. Or what's the value of a clean public building to, from the perception of citizenry about their public institutions? So when we only run on visible figures, we lose some of that important aspect of the value of public works. Neglecting long-range planning. I don't need to beat that dead horse. I've beat it for the last three weeks. Relying on technology to solve all of our problems. Well, there's got to be a better technology to get this done. Well, I found some, most of the time we're talking about attitudinal barriers. We're talking about attitudinal barriers, not necessarily a hard tool. Seeking examples to follow rather than developing solutions. Now, let me really unpack that because you look at that and go, wait a minute. Shouldn't I look at an example of what somebody else is doing? 
Absolutely. But what internal ideas could you come up with? What innovation could you create? And we, had, we already talked about that when we talked about systems thinking. We talked about systems for innovation. Excuses such as, well, but our problems are a lot different than what you're talking about. You, you wouldn't understand what we're going through. You have no idea what, what we experience. Really? There's some consistencies. Jeff and I were having this discussion the other day about algorithmic things that are seemingly uh, would not be able to be flowed through an algorithm are algorithmic. Like, how is it possible that I go online and it suggests to me whatever social media thing I'm a part of suggests to me 10 friends that I might be connected with and all 10 of them are. And I'm like, whoa! Seemingly random isn't so random. So, our problems are different. Really? Probably not. Reliance on quality control departments rather than management, supervisors, production workers. So he was talking it in the business context. Let's talk about it here. Outsourcing training to the human resources. Outsourcing uh, development to somebody else. At the end of the day, it's my job as the leader to develop my people. At the, at, at the end of the day. Placing blame on workforces who are only responsible for 15% of mistakes where the systems desired by management are responsible for 85% of the unintended consequences. So we bl blame employees, but it's probably the system. No better example of that than you go sit at a restaurant and you wonder why you're not getting your food, even though you see your food right up there in the window. It's sitting up in that where the heat lamps are. You see your food and you wonder why you're not getting your food. And you blame the employee because you're not getting your food. But you know what you come to find? Bad system. The ketchup's over there. The mayonnaise is over there. The pickles are over there. And she's got to go to seven different places, or he has to go to seven different places to gap everything necessary to serve you your food. Well, that's, that's management's fault. Now, before you judge that restaurant manager, let's look at ourselves. How much of the performance of the people furthest away from you is because you haven't trained them properly or because you don't have the right systems in place or because you, they don't know the expectations? At the end of the day, I've used that now twice. I gotta stop using that. So is it you or is it them? Well, Deming made the point that it's you. <laughs> that 85% of the time it's executive leadership's problem, not the, pr the problem of, of the individuals out in the field. Relying on quality inspection rather than improving product quality. So what he's saying there is that relying on quality inspection, what does that mean? Are you saying Ian, we shouldn't check on things? No, I, I, I didn't say that. He said relying. See, it's a, it's a mindset. I'll check it to see if it needs to be improved. I'll always be improving it, whether it needs to be improved or not. That's two different mindsets. Are you continually evaluating how we can get better, creating and innovating? Because if you're doing that, when things get wacky out there, you'll be more prepared. And whether that's you personally or your organization, there are some organizations when this whole thing came down over the last few years, budget cuts and railing on public servants and all that stuff, they weathered the storm pretty well. Now that didn't say it wasn't a little bit of a bumpy ride, but it was fairly smooth. And I could state you department after department that I know of that it was like this, as opposed to like this. Why? Because they had already had this mindset of constantly getting better, constantly getting better. All right, let's look at this self-survey really quickly. So the, the commitment to continuous improvement is the competency. Practice is ongoing personal and professional growth and development. I have a practice, I have and practice an ethical code of conduct. I have a healthy life a balance, mind, body, and spirit. I'm able to articulate my personal values. Now, why are those first three things so important? Because they act as a true north. They act as a true north. They're your decision maker. They're your litmus test. Here's what I stand for. Here's what I am. Here's what you can count on from me. And they're the beginning place for continuous improvement. I have a plan to develop and establish organizational code of conduct and core values. 
So then that emanates from you as the leader. Because I have some things that I stand for, we're going to create some things that we stand for. I know the important role that I plays, and so we're going to all get involved in that. I have a plan in place for the development of my greatest asset, my people. You're involved in this program. Use this program into the future. But this program in and of itself isn't the solution. What's the solution? You're the solution. That you'll have a mindset that you're going to continuously be improving and developing your people. And this is a tool to do that. I have a succession plan in place. Not I have favorites that I've picked out that are going to take my spot. No. I have a succession plan in place all the way down the chain of command. I actively seek feedback from other departments regarding my performance. One of the key aspects of continuously improving is proactively reaching out to get feedback. That's why one of the first things I asked you to do was send out that survey, that whole three questions, right? The whole three questions. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Suggestions for my improvement. If you could send me back to school, what class would you make me take? Remember that? Are you continually seeking feedback on performance? I have a system in place for communicating goals, employees' role in reaching those goals. I have a system in place for communicating what winning is. I initiate and maintain networks with other people and not just people within your area. I call it the power of loose relationships. Now I stole that <laughs> from Gladwell. So I, I don't call it that. <laughs> but I call it that because he called it that. This, this idea of it's nice to have friends. It's nice to have long-term professional relationships. That's really, really good. But it probably isn't a good, good tool for innovation and continuously improving. What? Yeah, they run in your same circle. They probably have same, some of similar mindset. They probably have some of the similar ways of thinking and worldview. Does that serve you well in improving? No. What serves you well in improving is people that don't think like you, don't go where you go, don't hang out. So the power of a loose relationship, people you don't talk to all the time, see all the time, interact with all the time, can usually bring you the greatest insight because they're walking in a sphere that you don't walk in. And they bring you a whole different perspective. So proactively setting that up. People that you meet, people that you talk to, that you're interested by, and you say, wow, this, guy, this gal's got it on the ball. Loose relationship, keeping a little bit of contact with them so you can gain insight and wisdom. I participate in new opportunities and way to improve and grow. That's what you're doing here. I actively participate in professional association, APWA. I place a priority on scanning for trans issues and promising practices. 15 minutes. Just take 15 minutes a week. Type into Google. Promising practices, leading edge practice, public works. Or just scan the APWA website. And the other materials that are out there. What are the coming trends? Looking out over the horizon. That's what your job is as an executive leader. The troops don't have time to do that. They're in the middle of the forest. You're above it. You're looking out over the trees, seeing what's coming next. Okay, score yourself one to ten there. Another thought, Deming, and then we'll get to some nuts and bolts and then we'll get out. Now remember, we've got to unpack this for three weeks. Got to unpack this for three weeks. When people and organizations primarily focus on quality, defined by that ratio you see there on your paper, quality tends to increase and costs come down. But when we focus on cost exclusively and not on quality, what we find is that eventually costs go up. Crazy. Now, you got to mold that to your specific situation, but think it through. Well, I don't have a choice. My budget's been cut. Yes, your budget's been cut, but you can still emphasize quality. How are we going to get to quality with the limited resources that we have? That's that outcome-based planning model. Okay. As an executive leader, you're responsible for creating a culture of continuous improvement. We're going to base that on three pillars over the next three weeks. Three pillars over the next three weeks. Creating a culture of growth as an expectation, establishing systems for professional development, succession planning, and developing bench strength. Those three things is what we're going to unpack. The first one, how do I just make it a part of who we are? I don't know. It's just what we do around here. We grow. I don't know. It's just what we do around here. I improve my skill. I don't know. It's just what we do in pro around here. 
we improve our safety approaches to things. I don't know, it's just what we do around here. We refine systems and protocols to make them more impactful and less stressful for us and those that we serve. I don't know, that's just what we do around here. How do we create that? We'll talk about that in the coming weeks, but for now, systems. It's all about systems. It's all about placing these systems in place, putting these systems in place. We'll come back to that because we're going to give you a system in just a second. Establishing systems for professional development. Systems for professional development. Succession planning and developing bench strength. So those latter two we'll get to in the coming weeks. In the balance of our time, I want to talk about this culture of growth as an expectation. So here's what you have at your disposal. You have experts at your disposal. You have absolute experts at your disposal. You have people that have PhDs at your, at your disposal. What? Yeah. <clears throat> a PhD takes about 10,000 hours total learning time. 8 to 10,000 hours total learning time. Well, you and I both know you got guys or gals that have, that have operated heavy equipment for more than 10,000 hours. You got guy or gal that worked in a water treatment plant for more than 10,000 hours. You got guy or gal that's been in the engineering department for more than 10,000 hours. You have people on your administrative team that have been at it for more than 10,000 hours, which means you have PhDs in your department. You don't have to look beyond your department to have vocational expertise and knowledge in your department. Okay, take that thought and set it right there. Secondly, you have people that don't know what they're doing. You have people that have responsibilities that they're not completely proficient at. You have people that not only are they not proficient at it, they're, they have no proficiency whatsoever at certain tasks and duties. And if we're being honest, you have both. The key is, somehow, you got to get this information to the people who need it. And you got to be the, get the people who need it to seek it and want it. So look at those two. Those are true. That's truth. You have a bunch of people that are vocationally competent, proficient, and have significant operational insight and wisdom. You have other people that desperately need that for you to go to the full potential of your department. So how do we make that happen? How do we get this information over to here? Okay, some ideas that I don't think cost a lot of money. And, and what's funny is, I think I, this, I, these ideas solve some of your continuous improvement dilemma, resources, time, and money. So the first thing we're going to do is establish those PhDs as people that we would want to be like. Now, obviously, their attitudes have to be right, their, their, their uh, professionalism has to be right, because you could have some guy that has tremendous knowledge but is a slug and has quit and stayed, as some of you have emailed me, or retired but stayed. So we don't want to hold those guys or gals up as an example. But there are some people who are professionals, are craftsmen, and they, and they are always getting a little bit better, your PhDs. So we honor them and we hold them up. And we go to them and we say, you have tremendous expertise and knowledge, and I'd like to get some of that that you have and get it into some other people. And usually when you approach them like that, they're open to it. They're open to it. Now, there's two ways that you can do this. You can do it formally. You can do it informally. Let's talk about the formal way. Now remember, we're establishing a culture of growth, but we're doing it in a very practical way. We're looking at the assets that we have at our disposal and then creating some action steps to get us to that goal of a culture of growth. So the first step in it is identifying those people that we want others to aspire to be like. They're vocationally competent. They're professionals and the like. And we hold them up as an example. And we say, here's some examples of people that you can be like. Okay, then what? Then we say to those people, how would you like to help us? Help us do what? Help us create a culture. How are we going to create a culture? We're going to take the best of you and we're going to download it into some others. We're going to take the best of you and we're going to download it into some others. And we're going to do that in two ways, formally and informally. Let's talk about the informal. So you go to this professional and you say to them, 
hey, you're a superstar. You've been here for 30 years. And it wouldn't matter who your supervisor or manager was, you'd be great at your work. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to take one person at a time and spend some time with them. Well, how much time do you want? Maybe once a month, once, twice a month. I want you to sit down with this person. I want you to have coffee with this person. I want you to build a relationship with this person. And I want you to take your philosophies and your insights and your wisdom, and I want you to pass them into that person. Would you be willing to do that? Eight times out of ten, they'll say yes. Now, what about the person? The person that needs the insight, the wisdom, and the light. Well, my suggestion is, at first, when you start rolling something like this out, you start with some fertile ground, someone who is eager to do it, so that, so that you get some traction on doing this, and then other people see that it's done all the time, just what we do around here. Are you talking about a mentoring program, Ian? Well, you could call it that to an extent. I don't think it has to be that deep. I think it's taking people that have knowledge and interfacing them and bumping, up, bumping them up against people who need knowledge. And then let the relationship happen organically. You just make the introduction intentionally and proactively. Well, how long should that last? Well, I think you let it happen organically. Maybe, maybe you have them have the meetings for four or five months. You know, just an hour at a time. And they just have a chat about where each other are going. And this person passes along tips and insight and wisdom and ideas. And this person takes it in. Well, what if this person doesn't want to do it? Well, then don't start with them. Start with people that would want to do it so that the idea catches on. The idea catches on. And maybe you only do it with four or five people at first. And then you do it with another four or five people, another four or five people. Because you and I know what will happen. People will improve. And as people improve, other people would want to participate. And that's the first step in moving to creating that culture. Formal. What I would do is go to those PhDs, those long-term employees that have the professionalism, have the insight, have the wisdom, and the like. And I would say to them, how would you like to take this thing that you're an expert at and how would you like to teach it to some other people? How would you like to take this thing that you're an expert at and how would you like to teach it to some other people? Eight times, maybe seven times out of ten, they're going to say, wow, thanks for asking me. <laughs> you really think I'm that good at it? Oh, you're excellent at it. I know it. You know it like the back of your hand. You've forgotten more about it than I'll ever know. I would love you to take some of that knowledge and teach it. Teach it. Well, how would I teach it? Well, we're going to set up a time, and you're going to share that information. Now, be clear. Be very clear now. That person may not have the skills to teach it, so don't put them in a position where they feel uncomfortable. So you might, And you might have to refine that a little bit by saying, what are the key attributes or the key qualities or the key steps to doing that thing? And they would outline them for you so that you've helped them create a little bit of a learning outcome and so a little bit of a syllabus. And yes, that takes a little bit of work. But imagine, if you will, <clears throat> if you could take that guy or gal that's been around a long time, forgotten more about that thing that we know, and that they could teach that to others. Again, you may have to coach them a little bit on how to teach it. But what I've, find out, what I've found is that seven out of 10 times, people will say yes. And five out of those seven or four out of those seven, you're going to have some good teachers. So if 40% of the people I ask turn out to be good teachers, is it an advantage to me? Absolutely. Because I'm taking that operational insight, vocational expertise and wisdom, and I am data dumping it. And guess what? I don't have to be in the room for it to happen. That's a force multiplier. That's a great system. Well, how would you set it up? Who would get paid? Well, you know, everyone has their own internal protocols, but I would set it up like this. I would say this month, this month, Bob is teaching blank. Anybody that wants to come and learn more about blank, we're going to free up an hour of your time to be able to do so. And you don't need to do that very often. Do it once a quarter. Some people do it once a month. What's my point? You tell me that you have no budget for training, and yet you have PhDs within your department. 
We have no budget for training, but you have PhDs in your department. So you just need to take and find a way to get that knowledge and information to the people who need the knowledge and information, especially in challenging and changing times. That's the time we've got to innovate and come up with ways to train our people. Well, I just, I just laid out for you a simple way of doing it. Well, how would you manage that then? In my opinion, it's pretty simple. What I would do is I got my PhDs, my, my, my professors, and I've got the people that need to be students. And sometimes that might go like this, right? A guy who's a student might have a PhD in something else or a gal or whatever. Once I have that little faculty made up, once I've identified who needs to do the learning, then I'm going to deploy it. But I'm going to make sure when I deploy it, the first ones I deploy have got to be highly successful because people will be looking at it with a little bit of a jaundice and jaded eye. So the first five people that go through your mentor program, although I wouldn't call it that because it comes with all kinds of separate connotations, but the first few people that go through your informal conversation program where you take people with expertise and pass it along to people who need expertise, I would make sure that the first four or five are eager and excited and have bought into the idea of being the first and that you can almost guarantee that they're going to be successful. The first four or five people that I would pick to teach a more formal class, I would make sure that they really are on the ball so that you come out of the gate in both the formal and the informal with some initial success. So I wouldn't run off half-cocked into doing it. I'd slow down and do it right. But the, it is simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Who are the one or two or four or five people that are great at something? Maybe you've got a guy that's great at supervising other people. Help him develop a curriculum by asking him some questions. How come you're so good at supervising people? What do you think are the keys to supervising people? What do you do on a daily basis to build relationship with your people? Blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, he's got a little checklist or a little syllabus that he'll be able to speak to. Or how come you're so good at paperwork? How come you're so organized? You detail everything out. Do you have any tips or ideas? Boom, 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 boom. And then they teach that. Now, I know of some departments that do this as kind of a brown bag series that once a month, there's somebody internally that's a featured speaker. And they got, you know, two or three months to prepare and they get themselves ready and they, and they talk to the group. And people come and, and well, if it's something that's more of a global conversation that would have applicability across all lines, then maybe a lot of people come from different subgroups or sub-departments or divisions within your department. If it's more of a very specific vocational and operational, Maybe it's just a small group that he's speaking to or she's speaking to. But can you imagine being that person? How proud you feel? How excited you feel? My boss has asked me to teach this material. I'm excited about doing it. And, and I can't wait to teach what I know. Yeah, but there's going to be some people that will be negative. They don't want to do it. Don't ask them. And if they respond negatively and say, oh, I don't want to do that, don't guilt them into it. If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. But watch this. Eventually, after they've seen more and more people doing it, they'll not want to be left out. They'll want to be the professor too. And that's how you create culture. You get some early victories. You strategically pick the people so that you know that they'll have a little bit of success. And then from that little bit of success, you start to establish a culture of growth. It's just what we do around here. We have these monthly little brown bags where someone internally who's an expert at something teaches it. And then the next month, somebody else is teaching it. And even though we have a reduced budget, and even though we can't go to conferences, and even though we don't have money, we've taken the operational expertise and vocational knowledge within our department, and we've created systems and processes, both formal and informal, to share that information, to rise the professionalism and vocational expertise of our department, through our department, with our department. Why? Because you're an executive leader and you find ways to win. And you're not making widgets every day. You're not making widgets every day. 
thousands upon thousands of people, citizens from cradle to grave, count on you and your department to be awesome. One of the keys to being awesome is continuously improving. And the only way to do that is to set up some systems. Now, the system that I just shared with you is about as rudimentary as rudimentary and simplistic as you could possibly come up with. You couldn't, Jeff, you couldn't be any more simplistic. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be effective. You have PhDs within your department, people who have tremendous insight, wisdom, operational expertise, and knowledge. You have people that need it. How can I get this to them? How can I get this to them? If I can get this to them, there are some obvious impacts and there's some unintended positive impacts. Pride, relationship, trust, bonding, team building, I mean on and on and on. The obvious, skill development, operational development, or uh, operational betterment, on and on. There's a lot of things that can come from that. Now, in the weeks to come, I'll unpack it again and give you some information and bullet point it out. But I just want to introduce it. And the, and the idea is this. I got experts and I got people that need expertise. How do I get them together? Now, what's funny, from that flows systems for establishing professional development as a, a, a professional development system. From that flows the development of bench strength. Final thought as we kind of start to wrap up a little bit. Isn't it funny? Those cultures that I mentioned, there was a, a mindset of the passing on of information. In the Greek system, you had Aristotle and Socrates and these boys. You had a guy that taught and, and kids that listened. And then they brought them underneath their wing and they walked with them over a period of time. The same was true in the Hebrew culture. The same is true in the Chi Chinese and the Japanese culture. You know, I'm a big fan of... of karate movies, right? And you have the grandmaster. And I follow the grandmaster. And I learn at the feet of the grandmaster. Right? Well, what's funny is, you have grandmasters. <laughs> and somehow, we just got to get people back into the mindset of learning from the grandmasters. My grandmasters are a pain in the self-bleep. Because they're just crusty and jaded and then don't use them. Well, but my kids, my kids, the, 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 the professionals, they don't want to learn from anybody else. They think they have all the answers. Don't start with them. So start with grandmasters that want to teach and start with people who want to learn to get initial traction. So isn't it funny that we have gotten to a place of self-made, I don't need anybody else, I'll do it on my own, so on and so forth. And those other cultures that, I, that have continuous improvement as a part of the way they do things, they, they, they would say that that's foolish. You need wisdom, you need insight, you need expertise. Now, all I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is, you got some people with expertise, you got some people that need expertise. How's that transfer of data gonna occur? And as you start to do that regularly, both formally and informally, then other things start to take care of themselves. Bench strength inherently will be developed. Systems for professional development will, if nothing else, organically grow up. Okay. We got three weeks left. We got three weeks left of talking this stuff out. We got three weeks left. If you haven't picked out your one thing, pick it out. You still got three weeks left. Follow up with your people, asking them, as they wind down the program, as they wind down, they're coming to the end. They, they got a week, week and a half, whatever it is to go. They're winding down. Ask them, how did your one thing go? So you can celebrate their success. Now, when you're done, we're going to send you some reports. Send you some reports, some final reports on your people, how they did and how they participated. We're also going to send you a certificate along with that. Now, you can do with that as you will. Some departments give out the certificate, celebrate achievement. Other departments don't. That's up to you. But we're going to give you the, the template of the certificate, and we're going to give you the information. You can use it however you want. A commitment to continuous improvement. 
practically speaking, boils down to what? You understanding why people don't improve and then taking the steps to overcome those and then establishing systems and processes to take the operational insight and vocational wisdom that you have at your disposal and pass it on to those who need it. The impact will be significant. Thank you for your time. Three weeks to go. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay, this one's for Gabby. Where the clouds are falling